So when I started my training in zoological medicine, I had no idea that the African lion would ever be in trouble. I remember, be ready guys, I remember uh, vasectomizing male lions so they couldn't breed. I remember putting progesterone implants in female lions so they couldn't breed. We didn't have space to breed lions. There were plenty of lions. Well, 30 years ago, there were 100,000 lions. Now there are 30,000. So in 30 years, two-thirds of the lions are gone. How many lions do we need? Now, that's a good question. But that trend, that's the alarming trend, and that's happening with species all over the world. Why is that happening? Well, us. <laughs> so we live where the lions live. We compete with them for their food. We hunt them for their pieces, their parts. We poison them when they kill our livestock. And now we are changing their climate. Those are the extinction drivers. We're, those drivers, those human impacts, are driving all kinds of species away. So this really sad thing for me is that I was trained to treat all of these animals. My patients are going away. So if this lion is sick or injured and someone calls me to treat it, you know, like, what's the point? Uh, I have no medicine for extinction. And so you may be thinking, well, it'd be nice to have lions around. He's a cool looking animal, right? Why do we need lions? How do we engage people in caring enough about animals to keep them around? Because the good news is we know what to do. We know how to save species. There are a lot of conservation success stories. We're even talking about de-extincting and rewilding. But we're not doing enough. You know, we think, oh, those people over there, they're doing the conservation. Well, I myself, I started off thinking that conservation was a science. And in most of my career, I worked with scientists. But now, what I want to share with you today is something that I understand to be true. And that is that the way we learn about the natural world, the way we take in the world around us, how we interact with it, how we feel about it, is both through the sciences and through the arts. And we need to combine those two if we're going to save species. And the only reason they're separated, well, there may be lots of reasons, but maybe the information age and the numbers of people and the amount of science and the amount of art is why they've been separated. But if you think about it, Leonardo da Vinci was a scientist artist. Darwin, Charles Darwin, scientist artist. That's what we need to do. If we combine science and art, I know we can save species. So I want to tell you a, little, a couple of stories about how I got to this thinking, and then show you some examples of how science and art combined can make a difference for conservation. So I need to go now to this slide that you've been looking at for a little while. Do you see the other lion? <laughs> I mean, I didn't see her. I jumped out of the Land Rover to take a photo of the male lion, and I nearly stepped on the lioness. <laughs> So that's how I was early on in my career, just so focused on the patient at hand. This is a photo from scaling the teeth, cleaning the teeth of an anesthetized Sumatran tiger. So you can see my hands there, you can see the tube coming out of the tiger. The tiger's asleep on a gas anesthetic. And behind me, right next to the guy taking the picture, is a member of Congress. And he's watching me work. And I had invited him, because this is at the National Zoo, and the zoo's budget but this National Zoo is part of the Smithsonian, and the Smithsonian is part of the federal government, and the zoo got a lot of its money through the, the budget process. So we thought, our budget is down. If we bring people in behind the scenes to see what we're doing, maybe we can improve our budget. We kind of called it the hidden zoo. Like, we were doing all this stuff, and we loved these animals, and we were figuring things out, and we saw all of our captive animals as being ambassadors for the animals in the wild. So I'm working on this cat's teeth, I'm trying to figure out if the congressman's interested or not. <laughs> I, I'm not sure he is, so I finished. I said, you know, you, you can touch her. So I said, you could just, you know, touch her on the shoulder right there on the, on the orange. He put her, his hand on her, her neck, and he goes, wow, she's all muscle. I said, yeah. And then I said, do you want to see? I found a busted tooth in here. We're going to have to call our dentist in to do a root canal. And he's like, really? So he peeks in, and he gets like this whiff of tiger breath. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And then he started asking me about tigers, and I said, there's only 250 Sumatran tigers in zoos, and there's only 250 in the wild. And his response was, well, that's not enough. <laughs> and it was like, it was our fault there weren't enough tigers. 
And when he left, I thought, oh boy, maybe I didn't help our budget out with that. But in retrospect, what I realized, and this has happened over and over to me, and all of us I know who work closely with animals, if you can bring somebody up close and show them the creature, they, they feel the same concern or curiosity or compassion. But you can't do that over and over again, right? You, certainly, there's not enough of us working on animals up close to bring all 8 billion people in with us. The second story I want to tell you is about working with giant pandas. So this photo, these are two giant panda twins. They're not twins of each other. They each have a twin with a mother panda not too far away. This is in a breeding center in China, the Wulong Breeding Center. And what our colleagues in China have figured out to do is not only how to breed pandas very successfully, what they do is they have lots of males and lots of females, and they give them a choice of each other at the breeding season. And if that doesn't work, they do artificial insemination. But the real trick has been figuring out by putting cameras on panda mothers that about 50% of the time, a panda has twins. But if you've ever seen a baby, baby panda, it's, it has no fur, it's a slippery little pink thing, and the mother has enough trouble picking one up. And usually she just didn't, doesn't pick the second one up, or she might put the first one down to pick up the second, and she, do, she can't care for both. So the panda keepers at Wulong have learned to swap the babies. And if they just take a baby into the nursery, it won't survive. It has to be on mom intermittently. So what they do is every couple of days, the panda keeper gets an apple. Okay, bears, bears like sweet things. Think Winnie the Pooh, honey. So you go in with an apple. Literally, they go in the cage. They hand the, the panda bear an apple. She takes the apple. And while she's looking at the apple, they switch the twins. <laughs> and the mother's like, whatever. <laughs> so we have plenty of baby pandas. Now the challenge is, what's happening with wild pandas, and can we put these captive-born pandas back in the wild? Well, I spent a lot of time in t China's nature reserves for the panda, and a lot of the nature reserves look like this. Now, this is a gorgeous forest, but do you see any bamboo in there? This is what the panda needs, old-growth forest with bamboo in it. And I spent about 10 days trying to get to this point, and actually, my team, we were exhausted, we were out of time, we had to turn around, and we were so bummed because our host said, look, we're almost there, we're almost on the trail of a wild panda, the closest I'll ever get. We turned around, but a couple of trackers ran ahead, and like an hour later, they came running down the trail, and they, they, they threw this bag at our feet and opened it up. You see what it is? Panda poop. <laughs> and it was fresh, and that doesn't mean it smelled bad. Actually, panda poop, it's just bamboo's a grass, so it just smells like your lawnmower, like grass clippings. I was so excited. So we can conserve pandas, right? We can do it. We can do conservation. But why is it that this species is the one that we spend all this money and attention on? And actually, it's not that much money when you think about it. If we, if right now the estimate is if we were going to take care of all the wild places and all the animals in the world, each year we'd spend about $80 billion. We don't spend anywhere near that amount of money. What's 80 billion? That's a lot of money. But so far, our country, we've spent 800 billion on a war we all know about. The third story I want to tell you is about being a mountain gorilla veterinarian. So I lived here in Central Africa for almost three years. This is where 850 mountain gorillas live. This gorilla is not in zoos. They live only in the wild. And you can see from this picture that they have their forest habitat, and then they have farmland around them. The conservation strategy for the mountain gorilla is this, ecotourism. You pay, you trek up there, you spend an hour with the wild mountain gorillas. It's an awesome experience. Put it on your life list. You have to do it. But what do you notice? Well, there, for one thing, there's supposed to be a 25-foot rule between the gorillas and the people. All right, well, the gorilla doesn't know the rule. <laughs> and the people can't back up. Actually, there's a crevice right behind them. And when I took this photo, it was my very first trip, so I was hired as a gorilla doctor. There are a team of veterinarians who take care of the mountain gorillas because they're so rare. And I had never been in the same airspace with a gorilla that wasn't a zoo gorilla that knew of me as a zoo vet who was gonna, you know, he was gonna smash something on my head because if he didn't, I was gonna dart him. Well, these wild gorillas are darted so infrequently. In fact, in my three years there, we only intervened 16 times that this gorilla just walked right by me. He actually came right from behind me and walked right by. I was, my jaw, I was, and I wanted to leave. <laughs> I wanted to leave the gorillas there. I didn't want them to have all this human contact. But at the same time, I knew there would no, not be any mountain gorillas if we didn't have all these people caring for them. The problem is twofold. All the people who live around the park, they don't have enough to eat. They go in the park, they set a snare to get bush meat. The bush meat 
uh, if, they, if they don't catch a deer, the gorillas get the bushmeat snare caught on their hand or their foot. The other thing that happens is we are bringing them our diseases, and that causes the occasional mortality. That's why we have veterinarians there. It wasn't long after that experience where I went up to see my first sick panda. Uh, sorry, sick gorilla. <laughs> sick panda. Mountains. Yeah. So I thought I was at the top of one of those mountains. And in fact, I was right on the edge of the farmland. I have no sense of direction. <laughs> I was exhausted just trying to keep up with the trackers. And I'm looking at my sick um, gorilla, and I heard a human baby crying. And then I heard a car go by. And I just, it reinforced this idea that there is no separation between humans and wild animals. And that we have to be there. We have to understand that human, gorilla, and environmental health is connected. And that conservation is about embracing that idea of health, both as physical health, uh, well-being and economic health and etc. like the, uh, the big idea of health. And I realized that as a veterinarian, I could only do a tiny little bit of that. And this is when I decided I wanted to teach. I decided after the gorilla work, I wanted to go work with people who in their work in some way were going to involve animals, nature, science, health, but they weren't going to be scientists. And at the time, I was focused on public engagement in science, on science communication, on getting more people involved in conservation. But it's been my students and the many, many professors that I um, collaborate with at RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, right here in Providence. What I've learned, and now I'm in my fifth year teaching there, that conservation is part art and part science. So take a look at this piece by a student, Lauren, who has since, since graduated. You know, this is the solution to panda conservation is to connect all those disjointed habitats. It's to do tunnels and, over, and underpasses and bamboo corridors. So you, you get the communication of what we can do for pandas. But what else about this piece? I mean, for me, this is kind of, of a forlorn-looking panda. And it's very busy. You know, there's human, human activity going on there. Well, that's the reality. That's what's happening with giant pandas. And some of what we get from this piece, I can't even articulate because there's an emotional subconscious part of taking in what's happening with pandas and thinking about what we can do for them. So this piece is informed by the science, but it, it's added to by the art. So I teach several different classes, and in one of them, the challenge to the students is to visualize a topic in science that might be very abstract if you're not a scientist. So for me, this is the idea of extinction is not abstract. But for you, it might be as abstract as a Jackson Pollock painting, right? So Casey in this piece is trying to visualize extinction. And he's using the panda because we all know the image of the panda. In this piece, Andy was exploring bycatch. So we, we, every, every time we catch our food fish, we unfortunately, in those nets, even though we know how to not do this, we're catching dolphins, whales, the wrong species of fish. So I started off saying we know how to do conservation. We actually know how to, to fish, let's say, tuna safely without catching dolphins. But we're not doing enough of it. And so when Andy learned that, she painted this painting. And I want to just give you some time to look at it for a minute. Because for me, it's a very disconcerting painting. I don't know if you can figure out for you if it is. For me, the reason is these are all faceless fishes. There's no faces. There's no eyes. So it goes back to that congressman who, when I showed him the tiger, and that was a real being, a whole creature, he was like, yeah, I want to care for this tiger. How many are there? But what if it's just a lump of fish that you can't feel about? And I think this is part of where we need to go, art and science together, to explore what's happening to animals and what can we do about it. And what's going to motivate us to take action is if we truly understand what's happening and we truly understand that there are solutions. Working with the gorillas, I got very frustrated about something. And only now, teaching at RISD, do I understand why. It seems so obvious to me. The baby gorilla in this photo has a snotty nose. I proved, with not a lot of, with a, a, along with a lot of other smart people, that the gorillas are getting human viruses, respiratory viruses, and sometimes they die from it. What we need to do is wear a face mask. That's the scientific, rational thing to do. But nobody wants to wear a face mask. So it doesn't feel good. It doesn't look good. You can't see your friends. You, the gorillas look at you funny. Now, maybe there's a design solution, right, for the, for the face mask. But the point is, saving species, the choices we're making, are not just rational science. There are lots of other factors. That's why the panda is a species we want to take care of. It's cute. 
<laughs> you know, it, and not minimizing it, I'm trying to get at this idea that we need to explore the choices we're making from a scientific as well as an artistic perspective. A couple other quick examples here. Everybody has a different life experience. So this is Sarah. Sarah's exploring the idea of extinction in a totally different way. She's bringing in human garbage into her silhouette of a human. I don't know if you can see there's a cup and a paper clip and there's silhouettes of animals in this piece. And the human itself is kind of blowing apart on one side and on the other side it's keeping it together. That's her idea of extinction. Now, we don't all like all the same animals, right? This is a pink-toed tarantula and some of you are going, ah, spider. Now, I'm purposely not showing you a snake because we know actually neurologically when we see photos of snakes, even you're hearing me say snake, you're having a negative reaction. How are we gonna care for creatures that we have no life experience with and that we actually don't like? What about ones you'll never see? 50% of the world's frogs are in trouble. 30% are going away. And unless you go in the rainforest with an expert guide, you'll walk right past most of them. Well, Sam, his approach was, well, why don't we look at the skin glands, are really cool skin glands on the frog that have all these proteins and peptides that are antifungal, antibacterial, even anti-HIV infective. Maybe that's a way we can think about frogs and want to take care of them. Maybe that's a way that they become relevant. Chloe was interested in honeybees. What's happening with the bees? They're in trouble. They don't have any food. Their environment's contaminated. And we know that one out of every three bites of food we eat is pollinated by bees. So not only did she do this series of posters to engage us in what's happening with the bees, she came up with a solution. By this planter, it comes with a seed, you plant the seed, the flower grows, it feeds the bees. Some of the work are, is a design solution. In this piece, Insel learned about the Iberian lynx, very endangered cat, lives in the cork forest in Spain and Portugal. What next time you buy your bottle of wine, look at the screw top, think about maybe I should buy a bottle of wine with natural cork. What if we made this wine bottle series? Sometimes the students are going for humor. So Io is playing around with health food, super vegan man, right? Sometimes they're just getting us with the beautiful piece. This is a painting of a very rare Hawaiian bird called the EEV. So finishing up here, I've launched a website with the help of a lot of people at RISD called Creature Conserve, and you can find examples of the student work and what I really hope it, it becomes is a hub for artists looking for scientists and scientists looking for artists who want to work together, bring science and art together to conserve species, because I'm absolutely certain that's the only way we're going to do it. I, I want to finish with a cute animal photo, but I couldn't decide which was the cutest, so you get three, and you can decide. This is a little flood, a giant river otter. This is Endakazi, a mountain gorilla, orphan. I think these next ones are going to win, but, right, <laughs> bandit cubs. They're real, they're real. Thank you very much.